Okay, I would say let's go ahead and start. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Crystal Ford, and I am with the Department of Family Services, and I'll be serving as producer support on this call today. So we just ask that all participants mute your mics so that we can minimize the background noise. I will be taking attendance, so please take a few seconds to rename yourself um, to show your first and your last name if it's not currently displayed that way. You can do that by right-clicking over your picture and selecting rename, or you could hover the cursor over your name so that the more option will appear and select to rename that way. Um, that way we can capture your attendance and you will receive the slides when this training is complete. Also, um, please type any questions that you have into the chat throughout the training, and the trainers will be addressing all your questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. So before Catherine introduces herself, we just had a participant say in the chat box that they're unable to hear. Can you all hear us? Thumbs up or yeah? Okay. Okay, now she can hear. Okay, I'm sorry. Problem resolved, go on. Okay, well, since we seem to be done with our housekeeping stuff, um, we're just gonna start by introducing ourselves. So I am, my name is Catherine Harlow and I am one of the, um, domestic and sexual violence counselors with Fairfax County Domestic and Sexual Violence Services. Sorry about that. Hi everybody, my name is Angela Acosta. I go by Angie and I am the sexual violence outreach specialist for the domestic and sexual violence services. Okay, um, and before we really jump into the content and the bulk of the presentation, we first just wanted to highlight why we're talking about consent today. Um, so why are we doing this presentation and why understanding and being able to educate children and teens about consent is so important. Um, so, you know, if we were in a big room in person, we would be able to kind of do like hand raising to see who's here because they're a parent, who's here because they're a teacher, who's here because they're an aunt or uncle. Um, so we don't really know that information, um, but it seems like everybody here at least wants to know how to have these conversations with kids. Um, and, you know, there is some, there's stats to show that about 13% of teens have had sex by the age of 15 and 70% of teens have had sex by the age of 19, which may be scary for some of the parents to hear. Um, but it just shows that teaching about consent is an important part of educating your child about sexual health and safety. Um, teaching about consent and learning about consent is also way more than just being about sex, though. Um, learning about consent helps children and teens understand that their voice is important and that they deserve respect from both themselves and others. And it can help children and teens understand how to show respect for themselves and others. It can also give children and teens the language to ask for help if they other, ever feel unsafe in a situation with a person or in an interpersonal relationship. And learning about consent can help children develop safe, age-appropriate, loving, and fulfilling relationships as they grow up and across the lifespan. So I'm going to pass it off to Angie, who's going to get us started. Okay, so like Catherine uh, mentioned earlier, a consent is more than just about sex. Um, general consent or non-sexual consent is important in our um, everyday life, in our personal and professional relationships. Um, many of us go to the doctor um, for various reasons and we give them consent um, to either look at our medical records or um, do a, uh, an exam. Um, you know, many of you uh, do work in the Department of Family Services or in, in um, human services of some kind, and all of the clients that we work with are giving us consent 
um, to partake in our services. Um, you know, I don't know uh, about you all, but I know that when I come home and, you know, it's been a really rough day at work, um, I come home and uh, ask my partner, like, you know, can I get a hug? It's been a really long day. That's me asking for consent. Um, Pre-COVID times, when we were all in the office um, and we would attend meetings or trainings, um, we would ask our um, coworkers to either borrow a pen, paper, a book, whatever we needed. Um, we didn't just snatch it out of their hands or out of their desks. We asked for, um, for permission. Um, and then the last example of that I thought about that we, uh, I personally use every day is I have a furry daughter and I always ask her for a kiss. I don't want to just put my face in her face because I don't know how she's going to react. So I always ask, can I have a kiss? Even though she's not going to say yes or no, but her licking my face is probably giving me consent um, to go ahead and smother her in kisses. Um, so consent is a permission for something to happen or an agreement to do something. Consent exists predominantly in other aspects of our lives, not just sex. So consent for sexual activity um, and not necessarily meaning sex. Um, when someone says yes to sexual communication, contact or inactivity without being pressured, tricked or forced, there should always be a discussion on what sexual activities each partner feels comfortable doing or viewing. Uh, in many cases, you know, um, partners might enjoy um, watching uh, sexual activities together um, or por pornography, um, but there should always be a conversation. One person should not be uh, pressured or tricked or forced to view um, pornography. Children cannot consent to sexual activity, even if it appears that they were not coerced or forced. Children, uh, because of their age, cannot consent, um, and they can't really understand the legal, emotional, um, physical, or psychological consequences that their, um, their decision may, may have. So, in the next slide, we're going to take a short poll. And I don't have, um, I'm not a host. Uh, Crystal, can you pull up the poll for me, please? Yes, I'm pulling it. Thank you. Can you see it? Now we can. Okay. So um, which of the following is an example of consent? So please click on uh, which, you which ones you believe are examples of consent. Okay, couple more seconds for everybody to answer. Okay, can we pull the poll results, please? Are you able to see that? Yes, thank you. Um, so, 12% says, no, I don't want to have sex with you. 10% um, said, maybe we could. Um, zero, what are you doing? And the person starts pulling away. Um, and then 93% of you said, yes, I want to have sex with you is an example of consent. So now let's go over 
the an the correct answers. Um, so there was only one correct answer in that in that poll. Um, so the first one, set, uh, the statement was, "No, I don't want to have sex with you." So that is not an example of consent. No means no. They specifically said no. Maybe we could. They used the word maybe. So it was not a yes. Maybe equals unsure. So you may wanna ask clarification on that, but that is a no. They ask, what are you doing? Questions don't equal yes. So definitely get clarification um, with your partner. This, the person starts pulling away. So nonverbal behavior always means no. And the only statement or body language that showed consent was yes, I want to have sex with you. Um, they said the word yes, and um, it cannot be said because, um, because of pressure. So there was no pressure involved with their answer. So the only one that showed the person giving consent was the last one. So rules about consent, uh, it must be verbal. Just because they don't say the word no does not mean that they have consented to the activity. Someone not saying anything does not mean they consent. So someone who is unable to talk because they're intoxicated um, with drugs or alcohol, or if someone is asleep, we cannot, there's a difference between a non-responsive response and an enthusiastic consent, an enthusiastic yes. So other rules about consent, saying yes to one activity does not mean there is consent to any other type of activity. Consent has to be given each time for each activity. Someone can withdraw his, her, or their consent at any time, and consent is not definitive. So saying yes to one, to one activity does not mean you will say yes forever. When it comes to consent, no is a very important and powerful word. No person or child should be forced or obligated to hug, kiss, touch, or otherwise be physically or physically interact with another person. So many of you may have watched this video um, but we are um, going to watch the um, consent, the T consent video, the clean version, of course. Um, and then uh, Catherine will discuss the contents of the video. And it's also important to note that if you have younger children, um, there is a video that, um, that is targeted for younger children about bodily autonomy and asking for help um, and physical touch. The, like Crystal said earlier, the PowerPoint will be sent to you. So there will be a link for that video, uh, for both videos actually. If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my God, I would love a cup of tea, thank you then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, then you could make them a cup of tea or not, but be aware they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important part, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you are entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say no, thank you, then don't make them tea at all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. 
They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes, please. That's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea, but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time that it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind. And you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they're unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea. And they can't answer the question, do you want tea? Because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea. And they said yes. But in the time it took you to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down. Make sure the unconscious person is safe. And this is the important part again. Don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they're safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it going, but you wanted tea last week. Or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat going, but you wanted tea last night. But if you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you're able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand it when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to go make myself a cup of tea. I love that video because it does a great job of highlighting the rules of consent and using satire to really let it, let it sink in. Um, so as you probably noticed from watching that video, it's probably more appropriate for older kids and teens. So probably like mi late middle school, um, high school and above. Like Angie said, there is a really cute one they make for, for kids that we would also recommend. Um, so one of the big questions is when should you start talking to, whether it's your child or the children in your life, about consent? Um, and honestly, regardless of how old the child is, the time to start talking about consent is now. Because like we've already started to highlight, consent is about more than sex. So you can start with teaching the rules of healthy boundaries, communication, um, and consent when children are young. Um, and then let the conversation evolve as they grow and new information becomes both more important um, and more developmentally appropriate. So with your younger kids, um, things that you can start to do is teaching your child how to ask for permission before touching others. Is it okay if I hug you? Is it okay if I give you a kiss? Is it okay if I hold your hand? And you can do this by intervening in social situations and actually talking your kid through asking their peers or siblings these questions. You can also model this by asking your child these questions. Hey, can I give you a hug? And wait for the answer. And when they, if and when they say yes, then, then give them a big hug. Teach your child that words like no and stop are important um, and need to be honored. And this means, you know, it happens in both directions. So this means that when others say no to your child, you respect your child to respect that boundary, um, but also that when your child says no, that other people should respect their boundary. Um, and that includes if, if it's appropriate and they say no to you and it's an appropriate situation for you to respect that, um, then thank them and respect that boundary. Now, obviously, as a parent, you may encounter, or an aunt or a teacher, you may encounter situations where a kid says they don't want to do something or no, and it, it's just not feasible. Um, so like if you have a six-year-old who doesn't want to go to daycare or the babysitter because they want to stay home by themselves, as a parent, you can't do that. Um, but what you can do instead of just dismissing it is acknowledge that you've heard them. You know, thank you for communicating with me 
what you what you want and how you feel. Um, unfortunately, because you're only six, you know, there's safety and rule reasons why you can't stay home alone. Um, so, you know, in a few years, though, when you're older, we'll, we'll come back to that issue. So acknowledging them and thanking them for their open communication. So even if their no can't mean as much in that situation, you're still teaching them that their words have value. Teaching your child about different feelings and encouraging them to read and respond to not only verbal communication, but facial expressions and body language. Um, this is something that you can do during play with you. You can stop and model different emotional expressions and ask them, hey, you know, what feeling do you think this is? Um, you can have them encourage them to have those conversations with siblings or friends during peer play or just watching their favorite television shows or movies, pausing and asking like, hey, how do you think Simba feels right now? Um, have you ever felt that way before? Um, and having a conversation about how they know a character might be feeling a certain way to, to start building those empathy skills. Um, giving your child the opportunity to say yes and no in everyday choices. As kids grow up, and not just kids, I mean, we're adults here and we're faced with so many choices every day. It can be fatiguing, it can be confusing. And as kids grow up, some of the choices they're faced with are bigger and, and scarier to us and things we want them to really be prepared for. Um, so, and part of that is helping them practice making choices, saying yes and no. Um, we don't want the first choice a child has to make to be one about sex or about alcohol or, or drugs. Um, start helping them practice in, you know, safer, more controlled environments with you. Um, so, you know, and these are parent approved choices. Um, so we are letting them choose between, would you like to wear your blue shirt or your red shirt to school today? Hey, sweetie, I'm packing your lunch. Would you like me to include an apple or an orange as part of your snack? So you're encouraging them to practice making choices, but you as a parent feel comfortable, safe, and prepared to respect whatever choice it is that they make. Um, and then this one you'll probably hear us say a lot, which is the, you know, once again, at all ages, we're not forcing children to interact physically with you, with other children, or adults, um, as long as it's it's safe to give them that freedom. Okay. So as kids get a little bit older, so maybe we're approaching fifth grade into the, the middle school years, so they're still kids, but they are getting older and what's appropriate them for them to know is increasing. Um, this is when you're gonna start to teach your child about puberty. Um, and it's important to start normalizing the changes that their bodies are going through. And these conversations can be awkward for a lot of parents or a lot of kids, but kids want to have these conversations with you. Um, and having these conversations and normalizing that experience can not only encourage that comfort with open communication that's going to be really important as your child ages, but you can also help to reduce some of the, the body shame um, and feelings that can come with entering puberty and, and the teen years. Um, we've all been there, so we know how tough it can be. If we can reduce just a little bit of that for kids, it could be really helpful. Encouraging your child to start having conversations about what feels good and what doesn't feel good to them. And I don't mean sexually, but more just in general. So teaching your child how to check in with themselves, how to ask like, hey, how do I feel physically today? How do I feel emotionally today? And to practice expressing what they're feeling um, and maybe what is kind of contributing to those feelings. So maybe they, they start playing a sport and they notice like, wow, I feel really good after practice when I get some exercise. Okay, that's something they're learning about their body. Teaching children to stop play periodically to just check in with each other. This can be great if you have like a group of siblings or cousins or kids in a neighborhood that maybe play really physically active games or, you know, games where they're roughhousing a little bit, like making sure that they're stopping 
taking a breath um, and that they know it's okay to be like, hey, does everybody still like this game? Or are we getting tired and do we wanna switch to something else? Teaching children, another thing we really wanna do that started when they're younger and we continue, um, is really reiterating and teaching kids that their behaviors affect others. So this is once again, building on that natural ability to empathize with others, um, using real life scenarios when you talk through things. So maybe they got in a fight with their sister because she called them a name. Okay, how, do, how did you feel when your sister called you a name? Or how do you think your brother felt when you didn't include him in your game and activity? And start to kind of see, oh, when I call my brother a name, my words make him feel bad. And once again, use, you know, kids are on screens a lot, particularly now. Um, so use those favorite TV characters or, or TikTok videos um, and ask like, Paul, hey, how do you think that character feels? Um, why? How do you know that? Don't tease your child, for if they start to have crushes, this is the age where they're going to have crushes on people at school. And it can seem really cute and really funny to kind of joke around with them and tease them. But we don't want to make them feel ashamed of it. So, you know, ask them open-ended questions. Tell them that you want to hear about this person. What do you like about them? Um, and really make sure that they feel safe having those conversations with you. Because as they grow older, the conversations could become more, even more important and more intense and you want them to feel safe having those. This can also be an age where kids start to want to have questions and conversations about sex, puberty, sexuality, sexual development. Um, and you might be initially inclined, your gut instinct might be to kind of recoil away and be like, nope, nope, not my kid, too young, we're not doing this. Um, Take a breath, thank them for coming to you with those questions and have those conversations because it is much safer for kids to have conversations about sex and sexuality with their parents. Um, if any of you have kids or have ever interacted with a kid, you know how curious they are and that they are going to find an answer to their question, whether you give it to them or not. Um, so, if they can get it from you, maybe they won't go to one of their friends who's also 11 and knows nothing about sex and sexual health. Um, or maybe you can avoid them trying to find answers on the internet and potentially finding something dangerous or scary. So as kids enter the teen years, this is when our conversations about consent start to encompass even more about that sexual consent component. Um, but it's not just, it's still not all about sex. We still want to reiterate that consent is a part of our everyday lives. Um, so here are some things we, we want to do to kind of foster a, a child's continued ability to understand consent um, and to use their voice um, as a powerful tool is build your child's self-esteem. Um, ways that we can do this is try to help your kid identify strengths that aren't based on physical appearance. Um, and this is an age where it's a lot harder for kids to identify strengths. So in my role as a counselor, I work with kids and adults of all ages. And I'd say when I get most of the kids I work with that are like much younger, when I ask them like, hey, what are you good at? I mean, it's everything. Like they're the fastest kid in school. They're the strongest. They're great at art. They're great at music. Um, they're great at everything. But then we hit a certain age in the teen years where all of a sudden it's a lot harder for them to identify those strengths we as adults can, can do that for them. So saying things like, hey, I noticed how hard you worked all weekend on that English paper. I'm really proud of how hardworking you are. Or, you know, hey, I noticed how you helped the neighbor carry the groceries into her house. It's amazing how kind and compassionate you are. So pointing out those moments where the kids in your life are doing really, you know, things that you're proud of um, and help them really identify that as part of their identity. This is a time where you want to make sure that you're discouraging language or actions that objectify or sexualize self and others. You'll, you'll hear sometimes like the terms like locker room 
talk, which is really uncomfortable um, and normalizes that, that sexualization. So set rules in your home about how you expect your children to speak about others, model that appropriate language as needed. And if you need to intervene and, and help your kids kind of reframe if you're hearing something that's problematic. This is another way that time that you can use media examples as an opportunity to discuss, you know, pr problematic behaviors that they're seeing. It's probably in almost every TV show um, that we watch is something where you could pause and go, hey, let's, let's talk about this. What was wrong in that situation? How was that, how were those individuals not interacting with each other in a safe, appropriate way? Um, or how is that a non-example of consent? And what would you do differently? Um, talking, and this is when we really want to start talking to kids about respect and consent in the context of sex. Because um, like I said at the beginning, you know, 13, percent of kids have had sex by the time they're 15, 70 percent have had sex by the time that they're 19. So these conversations are really, really important to have with teenagers. Um, and it's something you should continue to talk about. This isn't a conversation that you have once. It's a conversation you continue to have as they enter new dating relationships, or as maybe they've been dating somebody for a while. Making consent a part of just your normal discussion about safe sex. Um, so safe sex encompasses more than the conversation about pregnancy, STDs, contraception. It should also encompass respect, consent. How do we have healthy relationships with each other? Because um, there's more than just physical consequences to unhealthy sexual relationships. Um, and then starting to speak openly with your child about the reason consent is so important is because a lack of consent means that there's sexual harassment or sexual abuse or sexual assault occurring um, and giving them the tools they need to understand um, what those words are, what the definitions are, um, what it means, and to be able to ask you questions. So part of teaching consent and the reason that we want to do it is not only just because they're great tools for all of us as humans to have, but because there's safety involved in this. Um, so one of the things that, one of the places I like to start with a lot of parents, um, especially if I'm working with a kid, is making sure that we're teaching children the the words for their body parts, including their genitals. If we are going to call a nose a nose and an arm an arm, let's call a penis a penis. Let's call a vagina a vagina. Um, that those are not shameful words and they are not shameful body parts. This can have a huge impact on a kid. One, you can reduce that body shame. And you can reduce them maybe growing up thinking that the part of their body that makes that, you know, that their penis is something to be embarrassed about or ashamed of. By teaching your children the, cor the correct terminology for body parts, you can also increase safety. You're giving them the language they need to ask questions if they're hurt, if they need help, if they're confused, um, or the questions that if a situation was to arise where somebody touched them inappropriately, if a kid has a nickname, you know, if a, if a little girl calls her vagina a cookie and goes to the teacher and says, hey, so-and-so touched my cookie, a busy, frantic teacher might miss an opportunity to provide that child some really necessary support and ask the follow-up questions. But if a kid goes to elementary school and tells their teacher that somebody touched their vagina, that teacher is going to immediately pull in a counselor, figure out what they need to do to make sure that kid gets the help that they need. Um, so that language is, is a really powerful tool. With kids, we always want to be clear who's allowed to touch or see their body, um, particularly when it comes to their genitals. Um, so having the conversation about them that 
sorry, my dog is making a lot of noise, <laughs> that based on their developmental age, there are developmental stages where you or other approved caregivers might need to help kids with toilet training, with bathing, with getting dressed, um, and that that's a safe situation. That, and also kind of explaining that throughout the course of their life when they're younger and as they get older, sometimes the doctor needs to see or touch their body because it's about health. Um, but that if kids are younger, that it should be with parent permission um, and that the child and parent should allow to both be in the room to make sure that that kid feels safe. For safety around consent, we want to help encourage open communication with kids and parents um, and their support system and discourage secret keeping. So what I mean by that is, you know, encouraging open communication is letting your kid know, hey, tell me right away if someone makes you feel unsafe or weird. You don't need evidence for why, just if you get a weird feeling, come tell me, I'm here to help. Tell me right away if somebody asks you to take your clothes off, if somebody tries to kiss you anywhere other than your face or your face without permission, if they try to touch you, or if they make you feel confused. Discouraging secret keeping is also really important because sometimes people who are you know, abusive and predators will try to get kids to keep secrets. So how you can discourage that secret keeping is Teach your kid the difference between like a fun, appropriate secret and an inappropriate secret. Um, so a fun secret would be, you know, dad is throwing mom a 40th surprise birthday party. <laughs> That's a safe secret because everybody is going to know it's a party or, you know, it's the gift. Like, hey, you bought your brother a birthday present. Don't tell him what it is before he gets to open it tomorrow. Those are fun, safe, okay secrets but a secret that makes them feel scared, uncomfortable, yucky, unsure, gives them a stomach ache, anything like that, um, that's not a secret you want them to keep. And making sure kids know that no safe adult is ever gonna ask a child to keep a secret from their parent, um, particularly a secret that makes them feel uncomfortable. Um, you can also really help kids understand and feel comfortable with this communication by reminding them that they are never gonna get in trouble for telling you about a behavior or a person or a situation that makes them feel unsafe, um, that you are here to support them and they're not gonna get grounded for speaking their mind, um, that this is a safe environment for them and then continue to follow through with that. Okay, so in these slides, we've, you know, talked a lot, or I am the only one talking right now, have talked a lot about the conversations that you should be having with your kid about consent, you know, from toddlerhood all the way until, you know, they've moved out of your house and don't want to have these conversations with you anymore. Kids learn a lot from what we tell them, but they also earn a lot from the things that we model for them. Um, so we also want to model appropriate consent. Um, you know, the, the big one that we have already talked about is not forcing children to interact physically with you, other children, or adults. Um, and by not forcing, that means, hey, you don't tell them they have to go give grandma a hug goodbye before they leave. Um, you and maybe everyone in your family, if this is a project that you're working on with your kids, Get your, your siblings, your parents, your cousins, the whole family on board that, hey, we're going to ask, you know, we're going to ask little Johnny permission for a hug, a kiss, a high five, um, or to otherwise interact. And then if you ask and a kid says no, thank them for answering and respect that boundary. Um, don't complain or make them feel guilty or sulk off and go, oh, I really wanted a hug. Um, and this can be really, I do want to highlight that we understand this can be really hard in families, particularly families that are really affectionate, touchy-feely, that like to give big hugs and kisses as a way to show love and warmth. Um, it's tough. Like, I have nieces and nephews, and I, of course, I want to hug when I go to visit them. I don't get to see them very often. Um, but 
I ask. And typically if they say no, because I've just gotten there and they warm up and I go, okay, thank you for telling me. Usually if I ask later, they've warmed up and they're okay with it. Um, and most of the time when a adult, like a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, a, a safe person's asking for a hug, they don't have any malicious intent. They really just want to show love and affection. But we're teaching kids that when they say no, that the boundaries of their body and their decisions are important to us. Um, and we can even tell them, hey, you don't have to let anyone touch you if you don't want them to. Making it clear that no one is going to be mad at you. If you want to tell your uncle that you don't feel like giving him a hug and kiss goodbye, that's okay. He's a grown up and he's going to be fine with it. And then teaching your child how they can ask others for consent. Um, so this can be model, you model it for them and then you ask them to practice. Um, and even maybe practice saying no to them, which is, can also be really hard because obviously if your kid comes up and says, can I have a high five? Can I have a hug? You want to give it to them? But maybe practice saying, no, you know what? Not right now. Mom needs a little bit of space. How about in five minutes you ask again? Um, and you might want to tell particularly younger kids that this is something we're practicing. Mom is going to give you a hug. <laughs> but right now we're practicing what it feels like to have somebody tell you no and you to have to go, okay, that's okay. Um, and modeling. Modeling that it's okay and that everybody's fine with it. So we do have a couple of resources that I don't know if Angie wanted to explain. <laughs> I can go ahead. Um, so again, you will be receiving these um, slides um, shortly after, probably tomorrow. <laughs> um, so we've broken down uh, all the resources. These are some website ads that you can visit um, to learn how to talk to your child. Um, they are um, information on, for younger children, um, and also teen and college age students. Here are um, the videos. Um, so the consent for kids, um, I will be adding the T consent video link um, here just so you can have it. Uh, but the consent for kids is the video for the younger kids that we mentioned earlier. Um, and this um, video, Sex Needs a New Metaphor, um, is a very good video for um, older, like, you know, preteens, teen um, children. We also um, have some book recommendations, and we've broken them down to in um, for books for children, uh, specifically for younger kids, teen books, and then um, this adult book um, that we found to be very um, useful for when you are uh, ready to have conversations with your children. Um, and here is our contact information if you want to um, reach out to either of us. Um, but now we will open it up for questions. So you could either unmute yourself or if you would like to just go ahead and type your question into the chat box. I have one. Yep, go ahead. I was looking at a, um, information for kids about um, body safety and it was saying, it what it was teaching the kids was to yell no really loudly and run away. And I guess it comes from a vision that this would be strangers, which seemed not accurate to me, but maybe it's just trying to help reinforce to children that this is this can be 
a hard thing to do and you need to do it forcefully? So what would you say about telling kids how to say no? Hmm. So I think, so I can at least start off answering the question. Um, so what we know about most sexual abuse situations, but also particularly with child sexual abuse situations, is it is rare for the um, offender to be a stranger. Um, not impossible, but it's more unusual. That, But we still want to teach kids how to say no. Um, and that may be teaching them to say no and then come ask for help. Um, saying it forcefully could work. I mean, you could do exercises with your kids of just kind of teaching them the power of the word no by having them practicing shouting it, which might make them feel more powerful and more in control. Um, we also want to, and this might not be a conversation you would have with a kid, but as, as an adult, um, who cares about a child that you're that's, that's your child or somebody that you're working with, um, to be aware that sometimes in abuse situations, um, the person being abused or the person who's afraid freezes. So sometimes they can't verbalize the word no. Um, that doesn't mean that, that doesn't mean that they agreed to it. That doesn't mean that they did anything wrong. So kind of giving your kid when you're talking to them the tools, like, hey, you can do this. Like you can if you feel like you can do it, you can push away, you can, you can yell no, you can run away and come find a safe adult. Um, but also adding the extra, like coming to find a safe adult later, ask for help, you won't get in trouble for telling me what happened, gives the kids that freeze or aren't sure what to do in that moment an opportunity to still ask for help later. Yeah, just to piggyback on what Catherine said, you know, having that open communication with your kid, um, like it was mentioned in the presentation, um, because unfortunately, most of the time, if your child is in a, a situation where they are expressing their discomfort or saying the word no, that may not, the person that is doing the act may not respect those wishes. So allowing your child um, to come forward, to talk to you about what happened and how they felt, um, having that open and honest um, communication will be helpful um, if the person who is committing the acts is not respectful of that, um, that no. Yeah, and, and one more thing that I wanna add that I just thought of is also sometimes particularly with younger kids, if they're being groomed in the moment, they might not notice that they're, that they're afraid or that they're uncomfortable. Like that initial response may not be as strong, but later they might start to notice that actually I, I was really uncomfortable with that or that made me feel unsafe or it made me feel yucky or, or now I'm, I'm thinking about it and it's making my stomach hurt. Um, so really letting kids know at any time that you feel uncomfortable, even if it's been a couple weeks, like it's never too late to tell a safe adult um, and to ask for help because it, it might be later that it kind of sets in that something didn't feel quite right. Um, the only other question in the chat box was, are we going to have access to this PowerPoint after the webinar? Um, yes, all participants will be, uh, will receive the copy of the PowerPoints um, sometime tomorrow. Any other questions? So if, um, Nobody else has any questions. Thank you so much for joining us for our first um, sexual violence learning series. Um, this is um, the first one of many. Um, so if you are interested in checking out our, um, our other topics, um, I will include the flyer in the email, um, but it is also on our website. Um, so please we'll, we'll, um, feel free to 
uh, to check them out, uh, register, and um, thank you all so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. And if questions pop up later, you have our contact information. It will be in that PowerPoint. Feel free to send us an email.